blasphemy. This is madness. Hey there, I'm Perry Nemiroff, and you are watching RT Essentials. Today we're celebrating one of the greatest action stars of our time, a Scottish-born, multifaceted artist who has spent the last two decades building up an impressive resume of box office smashes. I am, of course, talking about Gerard Butler, who rose to fame after playing King Leonidas in the stylized hit 300. I'm sure you're familiar with his work on screen, but did you know that before pursuing a career in this business, Butler actually graduated from law school and held a position at a prestigious firm in Edinburgh? He was also the lead singer in a rock band called Speed. Are you still unimpressed? Well, I have more. He rescues dogs and donates to charities that help fight world hunger. Yeah, that's what I thought. You're impressed now, right? You better be. Clearly, Butler can do it all, but let's not forget what he does best. He plays badass roles in films with fights, explosions, car chases, and impressive stunt work. And we've got a whole list of our absolute favorites right here. These are the best Gerard Butler action movies. Den of Thieves. Let me ask you this. Okay. Do we look like the types who'll arrest you, put you in handcuffs, drag you down to the station? Hmm? You're not the bad guys. We are. Up first is Den of Thieves, a crime thriller directed, written, and produced by Christian Gutigas. Butler plays Big Nick O'Brien, the hard-drinking leader of The Regulators, an elite unit of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Cool name there, but not nearly as cool as The Outlaws, who are a gang of ex-military men using their expertise and tactical skills to evade the law. Big Nick and the Regulators must face off against the Outlaws, who attempt to pull off an insane heist, robbing the Federal Reserve in Los Angeles. In addition to Butler, the film also stars Pablo Schreiber, who you might recognize from The Wire, you know, one of the greatest TV shows ever made, and 50 Cent, who you might recognize from In the Club, you know, one of the greatest songs ever made. Though the characters and events of this actioner might seem over the top, the movie was loosely inspired by real-life events, and Gutigas went to great lengths to ensure that Den of Thieves felt as authentic as possible. He even consulted with the military, the LAPD, and some former members of the Hells Angels. And additionally, he worked closely with officials from the Federal Reserve to further understand their facility and how one might actually pull off such a heist. So how the gonna get out of this one? Not sure yet. So you get my number from Marcel? I ain't cuffing up. That's okay. I didn't bring my cuffs anyway. Which, after learning that, I feel like the film should come with a do not attempt disclaimer, no? Like many of Butler's characters on this list, O'Brien is tough as nails, a ruthless leader who isn't afraid to put his life on the line for the greater good. But O'Brien isn't your typical heist genre protagonist. He's multi-layered, struggles with alcohol, and badly wants to fix his strained relationship with his family. Newsday praised Den of Thieves and wrote that it's like discovering Butler all over again. Plus, the film grossed over $80 million, which is uh, more than you'd make trying to rob the Federal Reserve building, right? Just don't do it. <laughs> Olympus has fallen. They have commandos roaming the hallways with enough explosives to take out an army. Looks like the doors and windows are rigged with C4 explosives. Who knows what other tricks they have up their sleeves. Any team coming in is going to be ringing the front doorbell pretty loud. They shut the power down, lights off, and I assume they close the air vents. I killed the surveillance, but I don't know how long that's going to last. Where's Connor? We have no status of his location, but he's presumed to still be inside. Well, they're looking for him. They have his photo. <sighs> Sir, I'm here. Use me. In Olympus has fallen, a heavily armed terrorist organization launches an attack on the White House, and President Benjamin Asher is taken hostage. 
Butler plays Mike Banning, a Secret Service agent and former Army Ranger who must locate Asher's son before the extremists do and rescue the president before his captors unleash their ultimate plan. So this isn't the most original concept and feels heavily inspired by the Die Hard franchise, but you really can't beat this cast, which aside from Butler includes Aaron Eckhart, Morgan Freeman, Angela Bassett, Ashley Judd, and several other heavy hitters. Obviously, each of these actors bring their A-game to the film, but it's Butler who steals the show with all the heart and believable grit of action legends like Bruce Willis and Harrison Ford. Director Anton Fuqua, who had his critical breakthrough with the 2001 thriller Training Day, strikes again here and makes a film that should be predictable at every turn, but somehow feels fresh and, and inventive. Yes, it's kind of absurd that anyone would ever attempt to penetrate what might be the most heavily guarded building on the planet, but you're so busy watching Butler do his thing, you kind of forget all about the absurdity of the premise. Yeah, I guess I'm a little rusty. I liked your friend, though. He seems like a funny guy. What's your leader's name? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. How many men you have? Because I can... In English. On a budget of 70 million, Olympus Has Fallen grossed over 170 million, finishing second at the box office in its opening weekend. Critics praise Fuqua's direction with Time Out writing that the film is in hard-driving, good-humored command of its own silliness, and additionally, top critic Little White Lies singled out Butler for stealing the film. And did anyone think that he wasn't going to steal a movie like this? Greenland. But, but John, we, we gotta go back! Ali, we can't take her. But why? What? Well, so we take her to the airbase and then leave her standing there alone when they turn her away. Greenland was directed by Rick Roman Wog and stars Butler as John Garrity, a father along with his wife and son who embark on a journey to find sanctuary as a planet-killing comet named Clark hurtles towards Earth. As cities are getting leveled left and right, the Garrity's experience the best of humanity and also the worst elements of it as well. And now that the countdown to the global apocalypse is approaching zero, they find themselves in a desperate fight for a safe haven. On the surface, this might seem like your typical apocalyptic thriller, like Butler's adjacently premised film Geostore, maybe, but surprisingly, this one steers away from the over-the-top nature of such films and delivers something that feels far more grounded and believable. Almost too believable. There's even one scene where Garrity receives a QR code from the Department of Homeland Security, and it's real. You can scan that code, and the text at Garrity John will appear on your smartphone. I mean, I guess that doesn't have anything to do with a real comet hitting Earth, but we just thought it was a super cool detail there. Every marriage goes through sh**. That don't mean you get to jump into another woman's bed. You're right, I did. And I'm gonna have to live with that for the rest of my life. I'm not expecting your forgiveness, Dale. I get one thing right. I'm gonna get my son and my wife into that bunker. Originally, Chris Evans was cast in the film, but Butler ended up replacing him after Wog signed on to direct. Butler also produced this one under the banner of his company, G-Base, which he formed in 2008 with his manager, Alan Siegel. G-Base was also behind Den of Thieves and several other successful films. I mean, like I mentioned before, this guy can really do it all. Greenland was critically acclaimed, with many praising its elevated premise and emotional focus and calling it a much welcomed addition to the disaster genre. Empire Magazine called it Butler's best star vehicle in years, and Time Out wrote that Butler finally faces an adversary he can't punch. Really though, don't speak too soon. I could see him punching a comet in the sequel. 300. This is where we hold them! This is where we fight! This is where they die! And the shield boys! Remember this day, man. For it will be yours for all time. Zack Snyder's 300 is based on the 1998 comic of the same name created by Frank Miller and Lynn Varley. 
For those unfamiliar with this film, which is kind of inexcusable if you consider yourself a Gerard Butler fan, it's set in 480 BC, where a state of war exists between Persia, led by King Xerxes, and Greece. At the Battle of Thermopylae, King Leonidas, Butler, leads his badly outnumbered Spartan warriors against a massive Persian army. Though certain death awaits the Spartans, their sacrifice inspires all of Greece to unite against their common enemy. Yes, the battle scenes are epic and the film is visually in a category of its own, but the most impressive aspect is how in shape this cast, including Butler, was during production. Well, haven't you noticed we've been sharing our culture with you all morning? Yours is a fascinating tribe. Even now you are defiant. In the face of annihilation and the presence of a god, it isn't wise to stand against me, Leonidas. Imagine what horrible fate awaits my enemies when I would gladly kill any of my own men for victory. And I would die for any one of mine. To stay true to the original graphic novel, the script for 300 insisted that the male cast spend the bulk of their screen time shirtless, and because the Spartans are considered to be some of the most physically disciplined warriors in history, this meant that the actors had big shoes to fill. Actually, according to some historians, Spartans were forbidden to wear shoes, even in the winter and during battle. Big capes to fill doesn't matter. The point is, to get in shape, the principal cast underwent an intense eight-week training regimen organized by legendary mountain climber Mark White. According to Butler, he trained for six hours a day, and this was one of the most difficult challenges of his entire acting career. But the hard work certainly did pay off, because 300 was a box office hit grossing over $456 million and is directly responsible for launching Butler into stardom. Law-abiding citizen. I'm just getting warmed up. This is Von Klaus with total f***ing war. I'm gonna pull the whole thing down. I'm gonna bring the whole diseased, corrupt temple down on your head. It's gotta be biblical. In Law Abiding Citizen, Butler plays Clyde Shelton, an honorable family man whose life takes a tragic turn when his wife and daughter are murdered during a home invasion. He hopes for justice, but a rising prosecutor named Nick Rice, played by Jamie Foxx, is unable to properly convict the killer due to mishandled evidence. Ten years later, Shelton catches up to the man responsible for the murder and, well, tortures and dismembers him. It's actually one of the most brutal killings in any movie ever. Obviously, the guy was a scumbag and deserved to be taken down, but uh, Shelton might have taken it a tad too far. Was the ceiling mirror really necessary? Law Abiding Citizen makes a statement on the legal system, which many feel is corrupted and often fails to bring dangerous criminals to justice. I don't think so. Let's think back. What did I say? Did I want it to kill Clarence Darby? Yeah, sure, what father wouldn't? Did both Darby and Ames deserve to die? I think most people would agree with that. Did I plan it over and over again in my head? Yeah. Who wouldn't fantasize about that? None of these are an admission of guilt, Nick. You might want to check the tape. We know you did it. Well, it's not what you know, it's what you can prove in court. Didn't you tell me that once? In the case of Butler's character, Shelton, he was compelled to take matters into his own hands, making this a thought-provoking vigilante thriller. You'll probably find yourself wondering who the bad guy really is by the end of it. Originally, Fox was cast in the role of Shelton and Butler was slated to play Nick Rice, but they ended up switching roles. Funny enough, Fox and Butler would both go on to star in films about the White House being taken over by terrorists released in the same calendar year. The law-abiding citizen received mixed reviews, with some criticizing it for being too graphic. It was a box office success, grossing just under $128 million. Machine Gun Preacher. We're gonna save you now. Good morning. Yes, I want you to cross your arms now. Cross your arms. Yes, sir. Stand right here. Okay. Upon your confession of faith and your obedience to the word of God regarding his death, burial, and resurrection, I do indeed baptize you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Hallelujah! 
Next up, Machine Gun Preacher, directed and produced by Mark Foster, the man behind the films Monsters Ball, Stranger Than Fiction, and World War Z. In his biographical drama, Butler plays Sam Childers, a former biker who decides to go to East Africa to help repair homes that have been destroyed by civil war. Transformed by the horrors he witnesses, Sam ignores the warnings of more experienced aid workers and breaks ground for an orphanage in the heart of a territory controlled by a brutal renegade militia. But but he doesn't stop there. Determined to save as many lives as possible, Sam leads armed missions into enemy territory to rescue kidnapped children. Butler's character is based on the real Sam Childers, who is known as the machine gun preacher in real life. Screenwriter Jason Keller adapted Childer's book, Another Man's War, about his life as a former biker gang member turned preacher and defender of South Sudanese orphans. I cannot make them work. This is the only one you have. Okay, what's your hand? Your eyes peeled. That roll back there might still be hot. Don't be ready. What about you, preacher? We're staying. Go on, get out of here. Butler was so inspired by Childers and his story that he worked for a small fraction of what his normal rate would have been for a feature, and during filming, he would carry pictures of child victims whose homes were raided in southern Sudan. It's an emotional film, one made more compelling by its truthful nature. The London Evening Standard praised Butler's performance, calling him involving, even charismatic, and always plausible as a man of contained and then uncontained violence. Additionally, Film Comet magazine wrote that even during the biopic's most absurd moments, Gerard Butler is terrific, conveying gentle and brutal equally well. Coriolanus. My nobler friends, I crave their pardons. For the mutable, rank-scented many, let them regard me as I do not flatter, and therein behold themselves. I say again, in soothing them, we nourish against our Senate the cockle of rebellion, insolence, sedition, which we ourselves have ploughed for, sowed and scattered by mingling them with us, the honoured number, who lack not virtue, no, nor power, but that which we have given to beggars. Coriolanus was directed by and stars Ray Fiennes and is an adaptation of William Shakespeare's tragedy of the same name. Fiennes plays Caius Martius, a.k.a. Coriolanus, an arrogant and fearsome general who has built himself a career as the protector of Rome. Pushed by his ambitious mother to seek the position of consul, Coriolanus is at odds with the masses and unpopular with certain colleagues. When a riot results in expulsion from Rome, Coriolanus seeks out his sworn enemy, Tullus Ophidius, played by Butler, and together, the pair vow to destroy the great city. You might have been thinking that the world didn't really need another contemporary version of a Shakespearean tale, but then again, did the world really need another comet movie after Armageddon and Deep Impact? The answer is yes, Greenland. Also, Coriolanus was written like 400 years ago, so a little makeover was probably in order. No offense to Shakespeare. I'll fight with none but thee, for I do hate thee. We hate alike. Fines and Butler command your attention, especially in that one scene where they engage in a brutal knife fight, which took two days to shoot, and is made all the more impressive by the fact that this was Fine's debut as a director. Even Sir Ian McKellen, who has been performing Shakespeare on stage since he was 12 years old, has listed Fine's portrayal of Coriolanus as one of his favorite ever Shakespearean performances on film. As if that wasn't enough, this movie was universally praised by critics, with The Atlantic calling it genre writing that entertains while tapping into enduring truths, and Time Magazine writing that Fine's bleak overview should leave receptive viewers feeling daunted and haunted. But enough about fines. Did you know that Butler's first stage role and his first real foray into acting was in a production of Coriolanus? You know what they say, what fates impose that men must needs abide, it boots not to resist both wind and tide. Rock and Rolla. Almost there's something about Bob that I don't think you know. What's that then? That he's a puff. How the f 
Did you know that? Come on, everyone knows he's a flamer. You're the only one that doesn't know. He likes the boys. It's sausage and beans all day long, mate. What the are you talking about? Did he make a pass at you? Yes, he did. So what's the problem, hey? Eh? It was supposed to be his last night. You took care of him. That's what friends do for one another. Well done. Next up is Rock and Rolla, written and directed by acclaimed English director Guy Ritchie. It's the story of an old school mobster named Lenny Cole, played by Tom Wilkinson, who rules London's underworld with an iron fist and a score of well greased palms. As big time gangsters and petty crooks all scramble to get their cut of a Russian mobster's crooked land deal, streetwise hustler 1 2 Butler tries to play both sides of the fence as the lucrative deal falls into the lap of Lenny's presumed dead son. In addition to Wilkinson and Butler, the film also stars Tandy Way Newton, Idris Elba, and Tom Hardy. Is this a bad time, one sir? <laughs> I mean, we can always come back a bit later. <laughs> Many saw this film as a return to form for Richie, who rose to prominence following the success of his tonally similar ensemble cast-driven hit, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. But Rock and Rolla is wildly entertaining in its own way fast-paced and filled with style and swag. One particularly hilarious scene between Butler's character and his love interest, played by Newton, happened by accident because Newton refused to kiss Butler on the day of the shoot. And she had good reason. Butler had come down with a nasty cold, and according to Newton, Guy was forced to improvise, and it ended up being one of the most brilliant scenes. Watch the movie, you'll know what I'm talking about there. Rock and Rolla hit number one at the UK box office in its first week of release and has gained a cult following over the years. Also, that soundtrack is magnificent. Cop Shop. Hey, Anthony. You know, I'm not responding to that name. Anthony? Yeah, I'm not responding to that name, Bob. You heard Doesn't, me. Doesn't uh, Joe Tatino in Chicago have a $65,000 sticker on your head? Uh, he does indeed, Bob. And all he's gotten back are the heads of the holes he sent to collect mine. Clear off my contract now, Anthony, or as God is my witness, I'm gonna cut off your f***ing head, put it in a bag, and drive it to Chicago. I sh you not. Meow. Lastly, but certainly not least, is Cop Shop, directed by Joe Carnahan and based on a story by Kurt McLeod and Mark Williams. This one stars Butler as Bob Vidic, a professional hitman, Frank Grillo as Teddy Moretto, a con artist, and Alexis Louder as Valerie Young, a rookie police officer. Set in a small town police station, these eccentric characters intersect, and Young finds herself caught in the crosshairs. Louder may be the sole woman in this high-energy 70s-inspired thriller, but she shines with her deadpan humor and brings an unrivaled cool factor to her cop character. Not to mention, she performs an emergency tracheotomy and applies first aid to her own potentially fatal wounds. Vale. What? Pirate code. A temporary ceasefire to achieve a common end. As in, this end. A <laughs> little lost lamb isn't dead just yet. So I'm gonna let you send him off. Revenge for your family. Here, Butler plays a likable and sensible killer, someone you kind of root for and certainly don't mind seeing flexing their assassin skill set. New York Magazine wrote that Cop Shop inhabits an enviable Goldilocks zone for movies about dudes getting their heads blown off and called it clever but not cute, savage but not depressing, and cartoonish but not asinine. And RogerDever.com wrote that if the idea of a cage match between Grillo and Butler that's set in mostly separate cages until it isn't sounds like guy movie heaven to you, well, ascend it will. And there you have it, our selections for the best Gerard Butler action movies. As always, we couldn't mention every film that falls into this category on this list, but we have got plenty of new episodes of RT Essentials coming your way, so if we missed a selection you feel strongly about, fear not, I am certain we'll get to it soon enough. Thanks for tuning in, I'm Perry Nemroff. I'll leave you with some inspirational words, courtesy of Mr. Butler himself. Be the hero of your own life story.